up, everybody? Welcome into Between the Tackles. Michaela Vernava alongside Doug Hyde and Zach Cox at the Hall at Patriot Place. Lots of buzz around here at Gillette Stadium, and that is because the Patriots are headed to their seventh straight AFC championship. At this point, I don't think anyone is surprised that nope, they are that they are Old going cat. to yet another. And it's it's yeah, it's just habit at this point. It would yeah. be weird if they weren't going. I was saying after the game that I was like 20 years old. I was really young. It was a spring chicken the last time they yeah, did not go to yeah. an AFC championship Nate, game. Nate Solder feels like he's been around here forever. He has never not made an AFC championship game. That's insane. Yeah. yeah. He was a rookie that in 2011. So every That's single crazy. year he's been here, he has been in the AFC championship game, which is pretty that incredible. That like, really puts it in perspective. Good job, Zach. The Thank you. The first game I ever covered for the Patriots was the 2012 divisional round. So I've never missed an AFC Championship game. And they made an AFC Championship game even the year before that, before I started covering the team. So yeah, it's been a while. It's been a very long time. Best AFC Championship stat, this is going to be Tom Brady's 12th. He's played in 11. The entire Jaguars roster has played in seven. Entire Vikings roster has played in seven. Entire, entire Eagles roster has played in 12. And they have LeGarrette Blunt and Chris Long on their roster. So basically Tom Brady has played in more AFC Championship games than almost the entire league right now. It's yeah, crazy. Which is yeah. an, an interesting fact. And I think any other media members across the country would be playing the uh, smallest violin in the world if any of us were to complain about the extra work that goes into hey, coming. This, this is the most fun time of the year. But yeah, it. it is. It's an exciting. Yeah. rather be doing that than... You, you know, the I feel like I would be bored. Day. I'd yeah, be very, very bored if they didn't make an AFC Championship so, yeah. game. I'd like, be like, what do I do with my hands? What do I do with myself? You know? <laughs> Any other yeah. media members that might have heard that are definitely throwing tomatoes at me um, right now. But it should be exciting. I mean, the Patriots steamrolled the Tennessee Titans. They dropped down seven points at the beginning of the game, and after that it was just absolutely smooth sailing. Seven more at the end, book ended it with touchdowns, nothing in between. Yeah, um, they. What, let's start with what you guys took away from that game. I feel like there was lots to take away. Actually, let's start with defense because eight sacks, that was something that, that really got their pass rush going, which is great to finally be talking about the pass rush in a positive light and during playoff time. What did you guys think of that performance? Pretty dominant in all facets, I thought, other than Malcolm Butler. Malcolm yeah. Butler was like the only bad part of the defense. He allowed both touchdowns. I wouldn't say he was terrible by any means, but to allow two touchdowns in a game wasn't great, but Stephon Gilmore didn't allow a single reception. Like you said, they had eight sacks, and they did a great job against Derrick Henry. I guess the only other thing that they didn't do spectacularly was defend the run against Marcus Mariota, but you can't shut down an offense everywhere. So they're going to move the ball at some points and to only allow what was it like 20, 30, 40 yards rushing, whatever it was to Marcus Mariota. Uh, it was another like 20 or 40 to Derrick Henry. Just all in all a very dominant performance and it was good to see Stephon Gilmore I thought have a really dominant performance. Really great to see the pass rush uh, do well in that game. Yeah and even with Mariota they let up two 11 yard first down runs for yeah. Marcus Mariota on that opening uh, Tennessee touchdown drive. Then the rest of the game he really didn't do much yeah. of anything. I think he had 10 rushing yards the whole the whole rest of the game I know there was some some talk that he, he might have suffered an injury earlier yeah. in the game which might have kind of changed the Titans game plan a little bit but for a team that rushed for what was it over 200 yards the week before against uh, against Kansas City completely shut down Derrick Henry completely shut down Marcus Mariota for most of the night and I know Tennessee was out uh, was without their starting right tackle for a lot of that game but they just they dominated that offensive line this was an overall very very solid defensive effort I know the game kind of played out like most Patriots fans probably expected it to. The, t the Titans stuck around, kind of made a little bit of noise in the, uh, early in the game, then the Patriots kind of blew them out the rest of the way. But looking at that effort, it has to be very, uh, very confidence-inducing, whatever the word for that is, yeah, going forwards. I know that Titans fans are around the NFL, everyone's saying that, you know, the referees are, are in the book for the Patriots, that Patriots won because of officiating. It's, it's just absurd. When you win by 21 points, when you let up a seven-point garbage time touchdown included in that 21 points, the officiating had nothing to do with the fact that the Patriots won. The Patriots won because they're the better team. They won because they won 13-3 this year, and the Titans won 9-7. and seven. I mean, I also, uh, we might get into the officiating a little bit later, but we can do it now. I didn't think the calls were egregiously bad either. I thought it was weird that the referees have initially called a false start against the Patriots, then ruled it a neutral zone infraction, but it was the right call. So I don't know why you are looking at that call and saying, oh, this is why the Patriots won because of all the officiating. I think that it didn't help uh, the announcing crew, Tony Romo and Jim Nance were really kind of 
you know, a little bit over dramatic about some of the calls early in the game and, and talking about how all these calls are going the Patriots way. I think that that's kind of why Titans fans and why some of the national media is harping on the officiating so much. But to me, it had nothing to do with the reason why the Patriots won. Yeah, I would agree 100 percent with that. De Tony Romo definitely kind of played. I think he was just trying yeah. to trying to find some narratives going on yeah. in, in that game. He definitely played kind of conspiracy theorized a little bit during that. But yeah, like you said, it's some of them were maybe sort of questionable borderline, right. but you can't look back and say that was an egregious call and no. that changed the game. Patriots and were just a better team. blame the outcome of a game on officiating, I feel like in this situation where it was such a blowout, it's like, how can you even do that? Whereas it was a really close game and yeah. we've seen that where there's a brutal call and it ends up being controversial. And, and I get that. If it's a one score game, then yeah, that really can, if you can pinpoint the one call and it, could have resulted in a score for one team or the other, but that was just not the case. I even, in this I even game. think it was more valid in, in like after that Bills game a couple of weeks ago, where the Sammy Watkins touchdown was disallowed right at the end of the first half. Patriots won that game by what 25 points, but that you could kind of look at that as a, a momentum changer and a, a call that still nobody really thinks was should have been overturned. Right. But you look at this game, I guess you can you can point to the false start as that point, but. You look at it and it's it's the right call. Right. The, the guy, whatever his name was, uh, Treywick from from the yeah. Titans, jumps into the neutral zone. Yep. Then Geno Grissom Gino moves. Grissom back, yep. It's the right call. And then the Patriots just the, or the Titans didn't help themselves out by committing two more dumb penalties later in that drive. And then it was all Patriots the rest of the way. But you, yeah, you can't look at penalties as a, a reason for why the Patriots won this game. So offensively for the Patriots, Tom Brady lights out 337 yards, three touchdowns, no Alex Guerrero on the sidelines, and he was looking a okay. Yeah. Very 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 dominant performance by Tom. I think that bye week really helped him. I think that, you know, as much as everyone likes to dismiss it, I think the Achilles injury, I think the left shoulder injury, those things were starting to pile up. I think they were starting to affect Tom Brady down the stretch, and that's why he didn't look like himself basically from week 12 on. But in this game, he looked like himself. Still, the deep passing wasn't all there, but I think that some of that was just due to the fact that that's how you beat the Titans, be, uh, beating them over the middle. You're not going to beat them on deep passes. So I think that's part of the reason why he wasn't throwing deep too often. Some of the deep passes he had weren't exactly the most accurate, but I think that Tom Brady can continue to succeed and the Patriots can continue to win with the short passes over the middle. Yeah, I mean, you don't need to, to throw deep passes just to throw deep passes. I mean, the Patriots punted on their first two drives. On those two drives, they didn't throw to their running backs at all. Then they came out in the third drive. They said, all right, Tennessee is terrible at defending running backs in the passing game. Let's start throwing to our talented pass-catching running backs. They did that. They went a little bit up-tempo, and then Brady just found a groove, and, and they're off to the races from there. And not to get too far ahead at this point, but... I think that we will see the running backs used pretty heavily against the Jaguars as well. The Jaguars have two really good cornerbacks there in Jalen Ramsey and A.J. Boye. And I think the way to beat the Jaguars is on some flat routes, on some, some crossing routes by the running backs. I think you have to beat them in the middle of the field. It's a similar defense to what the Patriots faced against the Falcons and the, and the Seahawks in both their last two Super Bowls. And those are games that James White went off in and Shane Vereen went off in. So I think that we will see Shane Vereen. I know Shane Vereen. I think we will see James White and Deion Lewis used heavily against the Jaguars. All right, well, let's get into this matchup a little bit. When I Last week, we did Keys to Victory. I asked you guys what the Patriots would have to do to beat the Tennessee. Titans. Doug's response was literally just be here, yes. just show up and actually play. Um, is that the case with these Jacksonville Jaguars? Because they put out a heck of a performance at Heinz Field in Pittsburgh on Sunday. That was quite a game. Uh, Blake Bortles that was ridiculous out there. I mean, but when you think of the Jacksonville Jaguars, you compare it to the New England Patriots, it's like, do they really have a chance? But I don't come into this one as confidently as I did last week, thinking, yes, that the Patriots are definitely going to roll over the Titans. I, my prediction is that the Patriots can definitely still win, but I feel like this is going to be a battle out there. I think not only can they win, they should win. They absolutely should win this game. I mean, they're favored by nine points in this game. So the Patriots should absolutely win the AFC Championship game. But the Jaguars are not pushovers. I think the Titans were pushovers to for lack of a better term there and Jaguars fans the Jaguars players are all desperate for some sort of bulletin board material from either the media or the team 
It's just not going to come this week because I think that everyone knows that the Jaguars can win this game. They shouldn't win this game. And I think one of the keys to victory, if we're talking about that, is the Patriots have to win the turnover battle in this matchup. And that should be easy. Tom Brady doesn't turn over the ball that much. The Patriots running backs don't fumble that much. And they're going up against Blake Bortles, who always ranks high in his interception uh, percentage. But the Jaguars have done a good job of not turning the ball over. And they have a defense who can generate a lot of takeaways. So I think that's really key. If the Patriots win the turnover battle, then I think they absolutely will win this game. If they don't, then it's kind of up in the air. As far as the bulletin board material goes, they certainly got that from the Pittsburgh they Steelers. Did. We and saw and they're Levy not getting from the Patriots. Tweet out. Mm -hmm. The, uh, he loves round twos and we're going to get two round twos and making statements about playing the Patriots. He tweeted out something else that I think, I don't know if it was a, his rendition on song lyrics with the hashtag Wednesday. I mean, that kind of makes you look like an idiot when you then go out there and lose, but certainly was, if I mean, if I'm playing on the Jacksonville Jaguars, I'm going to look at that and say, are you kidding me? They're taking us that not seriously yeah. that he's out there just publicizing something like that and yeah we're not going to see that from it know, was it was a terrible approach route. and i don't know if i'm taking too much from sunday's game where the steelers clearly did not show up ready to play they clearly were not prepared they clearly did not respect the jacksonville jaguars but i'm as if I am the Patriots, I'm more worried about the Jaguars than I would be about the Steelers, it, which which might be crazy, might be just kind of recency bias or whatever, but I think this, this Jaguars team has a better chance of coming in here and beating the Patriots than the Steelers do. Just with the way that the Patriots have dominated the Steelers over the last couple of years, I just think they're completely in Mike Tomlin's head, completely in Ben Roethlisberger's head. The Jaguars, they're kind of a wild card. They're a young team. They're an incredibly confident team. They're, they've got a really good defense, a really good uh, pass rush, especially from, from their defensive front two great cornerbacks, but basically the, the entire defense is is really, really good, and they have Leonard Fournette, and if Blake Bortles gives us decent Blake Bortles instead of trash Blake Bortles, then I think they'd have a legitimate chance of winning this game. Yeah, I, I don't agree. I think that I would have been a little bit more scared of the Steelers, but Jaguars defense is Jaguars defense is better than the Steelers offense or the Steelers defense. I think that yes. the difference here is just that I don't have a lot of confidence in the Jaguars' offense to do anything against the Patriots' defense, but I mean, the Patriots' defense could certainly implode. I think that the Patriots' defense is certainly playing at the highest level they have all year. Uh, they have been impressive for the last, what, 12, 13, 14 yeah. weeks, something like that. But it is still a unit that is not overly talented, I guess I would say, outside of the secondary. Their defensive front doesn't have a lot of stars in it. Their linebacking crew doesn't have a lot of stars in it. So you could see a possibility where the Jaguars offense could move the ball on them. I just don't see it happening. I can't see the Jaguars offense scoring more than one or two touchdowns in this game. And that means that the Jaguars defense, I think, would have to generate some points in this game on turnovers and scoring off of those turnovers. I think if the Patriots do win this game, which I am expecting them to do, if I had to, if I had to pick, I think the Patriots will win this game and move on to the Super Bowl. I think if they do win, you're going to hear a lot of, of similar stuff that we heard last year in the locker room, for, especially from the defense, saying, hey, everybody right. everybody was, was pumping the Jaguars' tires last, uh, this week. Our defense is really good, too. I mean, it's not definitely not the the, the star-studded unit that, that the Jaguars have. I was, looking, I was writing a story about Ricky Jean-Francois mm -hmm. last night. I was looking at the people, the players they have in their front seven. I think only three of them were here last year. Because yeah. you, you look there, you got Dietrich Wise, Adam Butler, Eric Lee, um, guys like, like James, James Harrison, Harrison and, yeah. and John Francois, who were kind of cast offs from, from mm -hmm. where they were. Marquise Flowers, who barely even played on defense at all last year. Mm -hmm. it's, it makes sense that, that the kind of general public doesn't respect these guys as a, a good defense and still thinks that the Patriots' pass rush kind of sucks, even though recently it, it hasn't. They've been pretty good against the run and against the pass, and I think in a game like this they can kind of assert themselves as, as a legitimate unit. Yeah, it's kind of amazing even how many players on the front seven weren't even here in week one. Yep. And you're talking about Eric Lee, James Harrison, and Ricky Jean-Francois, all of whom are playing pretty big roles on defense. Yep. They were not here until midway through the season. And even, yep. like you were saying, Marquise Flowers, he didn't play defense until a few weeks in the season. So yeah, it's a lot of new faces on there, but they're all playing well and they're all gelling really well right now. Just on the predictions wise, I do have to say that I think I agree with you, Zach, and that I am more worried about the Jaguars coming into Gillette Stadium than I would have been by the Steelers and I do feel like maybe a lot of people think that that's crazy. I guess especially after seeing the coaching Steelers coaching staff implosion on Sunday that sort of maybe is changing the way that I'm 
thinking about it. It's that Changing your perception. Yeah, I guess. But I, yeah, I'm more worried about this Jaguars team and for the reasons you mentioned, and then also the Coughlin. Yeah, yeah I was going to say that. How do we feel? The, how do we feel about yeah, the, the Coughlin I mean, factor? I know that that's. I don't know. A big, big <laughs> X factor maybe I, seems irrelevant, but I don't think it is. I don't, irrelevant. Big, big X factor is a bold statement. It's, it's, I've been going back and <laughs> I forth mean, on X this factor this week. in terms of it's not what's going on on the field, or, yeah. but he's there. The, like, the culture <laughs> and the team and the, the mindset that he's put in place, yeah. you can definitely see on this Jaguars team. They're a completely different team. This is That's the, what this I'm the same team that finished 3 and 13 <laughs> last year. And right. They've added a couple huge pieces, yeah. of course, in Calais Campbell, Leonard Fournette, AJ Bouye, guys yeah. like that. But a lot of this team was here last year yeah. and they were terrible. They, they definitely, Coughlin definitely instilled the, the kind of culture, the kind of mindset that that had he was able to have so much success with in in New York. I I think I just hear Tom Coughlin and I'm like, whoa! Like, <laughs> I think any like if Tom Coughlin like owned a team 20 years from now, I think they would have a chance to beat the Patriots. Or if like his son played on a team or something like just Coughlin being That's associated with the team. I just like <laughs> it gets into my mind and I'm like, he has a chance to beat the Patriots. Yeah. It's probably dumb. <laughs> probably doesn't make any sense but thank you for articulating what I, the, what I was trying to say because that's what I was trying to say and you articulated it perfectly I didn't Tom, articulate it that well but that's no but you did you did better than me like, Tom Coughlin will I literally tried. be in the press box for this game though I mean that's important to remember he's gonna be sitting behind us in the press he's gonna box. be so yelling he, to himself the yeah he will game, be he'll be is... talking to himself and grumbling but I think you know as far as preparation goes as far as building the team goes yes he definitely had a big impact in this team being where they are and being 10 and 6 but he's not coaching in this game, and he's he, he's going to have as much impact on the in-game of the Jaguars' performance as we are because yeah. he's going to be sitting in the press box. But he's just going to be casting an aura. <laughs> <laughs> well, so am I, I. <laughs> and so are you, and so is Zach. No, but yeah. we are neutral and unbiased journalists. It's yeah, but different. I'll still be casting an aura. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, anyway. I'm feeling, like, I'm feeling like the Jaguars right now. He's <laughs> bulletin board material over my aura. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Jaguars aura definitely. Is very disrespectful. Yeah, <laughs> I'm very sorry to Doug's aura. Let me just I can't believe it. this. <laughs> um, anyway, the Jaguars are certainly do have embraced that underdog mentality. Yes. I feel like and have run with it. And on the sure flip have. side, we have the Patriots, who kind of I feel like embrace an underdog mentality, even though they're never really underdogs. They Not take at this point, the no. exterior bulletin board material yeah. and people just casting stones and whatever their way and they take it in stride and ignore it and when we put both those teams on the field on Sunday I don't know I do I think it's going to be a challenge for the Patriots but it is it's certainly hard to envision them not coming out on top giving given their track it record was, in the past it was pretty funny the other day um, we the, the Patriots first day of, of media availability after um, the AFC championship matchup was was set this was the day after Jalen Ramsey came out at that at Jaguars rally and said like basically we're gonna win the Super Bowl yeah. and players were asked about that we were, we were in uh, news conferences with with Matthew Slater and Deron Harmon who are two of the the more well-spoken players on this team and it was hilarious just how like as soon as they, they were like what do you, how do you feel about these Jalen Ramsey comments like you know Jalen Ramsey's one of the best players in the NFL. This guy's elite. Like, what did Matthew Slater say? He said, he looked at him, the good Lord, looked at him and said, said, Lord, let there be corner. And there he was. And that's this entire team. They're so good, man. Like, this is an elite team. We're going to have a real challenge. And I can picture the, the guys down at Jacksonville just being like, yo, stop being nice to us. Come on, come on. <laughs> they're like, they're desperate for okay, someone well, so to say something. Okay, well, so that leads us into our social sack. Let's get yep. to that right now and hang on because I had it right queued up but then our producer sent us some other material I gotta scroll pictures. through. Um, so Telvin Smith tweets out after well so this is Tom Brady's quote about the Jaguars is that this is the biggest challenge we've faced all year. And in response to that Telvin Smith tweets, brah, this is the oldest trick. Pump was it us bra up or in bra? it was bra. B R U H Bra. Bra. This is the this the oldest trick. Pump us up in the media, but in the building, I know what's really being said. And then he has a little the fist, fist respect, and then respects, and then respects the goat. This is a hmm. this is a terrible take by Telvin Smith. Absolutely yeah. horrible take, because the Patriots are saying the exact same thing within the building. And if Bill Belichick heard anyone on the Patriots saying anything other than the fact that this is their biggest challenge of the year. 
I would fear for their lives. I, Bill Belichick would, would annihilate them if they are not taking the Jaguars seriously. Patriots are 100% taking the Jaguars seriously. Maybe some of the players aren't thinking that the Jaguars can beat them, but they're certainly not saying it. No one in Gillette Stadium is saying that the Jaguars uh, can't win this game. So, I don't know. I think this is just Telvin Smith desperately wanting some sort of motivation from Tom Brady. And no, the Patriots are going to kill them with kindness all week. And it's not just an act. This is what Bill Belichick is saying to the players in meetings. This is what Tom Brady is saying to, this is what all of the Patriots defensive leaders, offensive leaders are saying. They are all taking the Jaguars seriously. And this is the Patriots biggest test of the season. Jaguars are the other team that made it to the AFC right. championship game. So. You can't look at the Steelers and say that they were a bigger test than the Jaguars because the Jaguars beat the Steelers twice this season, just Killed like them. the Patriots yeah. beat the Steelers once this season. So this is their biggest test. This is what the Patriots are th thinking. This is what the Patriots are saying. This is not some sort of act that the Patriots are putting on. The Patriots are not the Jaguars. I think that that's really what it comes down to. When the Jaguars, they can get by on their own motivation of thinking that they're better than everyone else, and thinking that the Patriots might not have a chance, and the Patriots are going to do the absolute opposite where I don't know if they can feel Do disrespect in this matchup. No, the Patriots. You said the, pa the Patriots are not the Jaguars. They get by by thinking they're, they're better than everybody else? No, no, the no, Jaguars think better. that they're better oh, than everyone okay. else. I think that, I mean, that's what you see Sorry. from Jalen Ramsey on the field when he's saying we're going to win the Super Bowl. I think that they get off on this overconfidence. And I don't think that that's the, the way that the Patriots handle business. That's not the way the Patriots have ever handled business. That's not the way that Bill Belichick handles business. So I think they're taking themselves very seriously. And as far as disrespect goes for the Patriots, it's pretty hard to feel disrespected. You're 13 and three. This is your seventh straight AFC championship game. But if there is an area where they could feel disrespected, and you touched on this earlier, it would be their defense because everyone's talking up the Jaguars defense like they're the second coming of the 1985 Bears. And since week four of week five, whatever it is, the Patriots defense has been the best in points allowed. The Patriots defense has been the number one ranked in scoring. So I think, you know, obviously the Patriots believe that that's the most important thing. Points allowed is the most important thing. It doesn't matter how many yards you allow. So maybe the Patriots defense will feel a little bit disrespected, but I kind of doubt they're going to say that to the media this week. After the game, they probably will. We'll have yes. to talk to Kyle Van Noy after yes. the game, get his thoughts. <laughs> I think, too, the point that the Patriots take every opponent seriously, and honestly, I think that that's why they're so successful, yes. is that truly, no matter if they're playing the Browns or whoever it is, Bill Belichick gets up to the podium and says yeah. how great the quarterback is, how great the coaching staff is, how great the punter is, how great their special teams units are, how great their equipment manager is <laughs> like he's but he truly says that about everyone and I genuinely feel that he does even if he doesn't think that they're the best in the league he is taking them seriously yes. because there's nothing mm. more embarrassing than going out and losing right. to a team that you should beat but then when you look at the Jaguars this isn't the Cleveland Browns and even oh, though no. I feel like they've carried that Cleveland Browns-esque uh, reputation the over the past right. decade or so because they've been pretty atrocious but they're not anymore, and they right. haven't been pretty much all season. Yeah, Blake Bortles has had his ups and downs, but he had an up on Sunday, and if he plays like that on Sunday, then the and defense does what they do. I think the Patriots know very well that they have a good I contender think, in yeah, front of Yeah, I think them. something that goes into to Bill Belichick's kind of motivational style, too, is the fact that he's been here for so long. He's The Patriots have pretty much experienced everything since Bill Belichick has gotten here, other than a complete disaster 3 and 13 season. I mean, they've won the they won Super Bowls and they've lost at home in the playoffs to teams they absolutely should not have lost to in the Jets in 2010 and they came up not ready to play at all against the the Ravens in 2009. So he can easily point. He can say I've coached teams here that didn't show up prepared to play the opponent that they were going to play and they've lost. And if you don't show up prepared, that's going to happen again. So he's it's definitely in his motivational playbook and I'm sure he's pumping that all week and he doesn't even really have to. I mean, it's not the, the if you if they were playing the the Chiefs or the the Titans or somebody or somebody else in this game, mm -hmm. I can see him needing a little bit more motivational juice. But this Jaguars team is very very good. So one thing I do want to touch on Leonard Fournette is obviously a big part of the Jags offense was in a bit of a fender bender, which thankfully that wasn't serious and he is expected to play on Sunday. Also dealing with an ankle injury yeah, too. Yeah, so. separate so, but from that's what I, yeah. what I wanted to ask you guys about is not having him at full strength, how much you think that will impact Jacksonville? I think it could hurt them. I mean, they do have some good backup running backs and TJ Yeldon and Chris Ivory, but Fournette is really the heart of that offense. So 
Jaguars are certainly going to hope that he's 100%. If he's not, that certainly could affect their game plan a little bit because he's definitely the most dangerous aspect of that offense. Yeah, they're at their best when they're either handing the ball to Leonard Fournette or using play action off Leonard Fournette. That's when Blake Bortles is by far far and away better using play action than he is just straight drop back. So if you take out Fournette, you take out the, the kind of rushing threat, that really changes the entire Jaguars offense. And as far as the Patriots for an injury update, Rex Burkhead and Mike Gillis Lee obviously did not play on Sunday against the Titans. What do you think about their availability for this game? Do you think we'll maybe see them activated well, the report out there was that Burkhead should be right for the AFC Championship game, but the report out there before the playoffs was they should be right for the playoffs. So just kind of have to wait and see. But if the Patriots can add Burkhead to that offense, that's just another key piece that, you know, has some versatility and uh, could give Deion Lewis a, a little bit of a rest. Gilsley, even if he's healthy, I'm not sure if he would be active in this game just because, you know, they have other pieces in there. But, um, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the other – question marks as far as injuries go would be cornerback Jonathan Jones and wide receiver Malcolm Mitchell. And, and they could be tied together. Offensive even. tackle Adrian Waddle as well. Waddell. I think that could be I mean I don't see a considerable difference between Adrian Waddle and, and Cameron Fleming. They've kind of flip-flopped back and forth yeah. between that starting right tackle spot since, since Marcus Cannon went down. But one takeaway that I had from, from training camp, I mean, we're going way back, and <laughs> Bill Belichick was, he said that was, or Matthew Slater said it was eons ago. You can't take that much away. But Yannick Ngakwe looked awesome when he was here in yeah. joint practices, and he destroyed Cameron Fleming for mm -hmm. three straight days. Obviously, it's been a long way since that, but Yannick Ngakwe is one of those really talented uh, Jaguars pass rushers. If you don't have a full strength uh, offensive line, one of those guys can hurt you, so. Patriots and want to be as healthy as possible up there. The Fleming Waddle thing has been interest, interesting because Fleming has allowed fewer pressures overall when he's been at right tackle, but he allows a lot of sacks, whereas Adrian Waddle allows a lot of pressures, but he's not allowing a lot of sacks. He's not letting guys finish on Tom Brady um, with those sacks. So I don't know, it, it's, it'll be interesting and really. The biggest question mark there is if Adrian Waddle can't play, then you've got Cole Croston as the team's number three offensive tackle, and he has barely played all season. I think he has eight offensive Just snaps. Just in garbage time, too. Yeah. That would be scary if Cole Croston had to play in this game, and the Patriots might even have to do a little bit of shuffling around. Maybe you'd see Joe Tooney at tackle, and you'd have to have Ted Karras come in there uh, at guard. They, I don't think they want Cole Croston to play meaningful snaps you know, under any circumstance. So yeah, that would be an issue if... Waddle can't play, and if Fleming went down with an injury, yeah, or if Nate's older. Waddle and Fleming both have been injured. Both have missed games due to injury yeah. this year, so they're both kind of injury risks when they're out there. You'd rather have two guys that are injury risks than just one of them and have to end up down with you with a rookie in there. Yeah. So Malcolm Mitchell is one that everyone was wondering about last week. He was not activated, but he, while on IR, has been being plenty basic, as we've discussed <laughs> several times on this podcast. We like to do the NFL basic bro of the week, and he certainly – after a nice yeah. divisional win, yeah. he's out there. I don't know, is this a K-cup? Is it an espresso machine? I don't know what he's doing, but yeah. it's awfully basic. But he seems to be relaxed, enjoying himself. Um, so that's good. But do you think we'll maybe see him this week out <laughs> in pads? We'll, we'll know by the, the end kitchen, of the day. Yeah. But out I on mean, a football field. 4 p.m. Yeah, the, the deadline to, to activate him, to add him to the 53-man roster is 4 p.m. today. So if they don't do that, then he cannot play in the FC Championship game. He cannot play in the Super Bowl if the Patriots make it there. So he will have to be added to the roster today if they want to activate him, which means they would also have to take somebody off the roster, either cutting someone or putting someone on injured deserve. Yeah, uh, Mike Reese from ESPN made a good point where Jonathan Jones got injured late in the game against the Titans. And if that's an injury that will keep him out through the Super Bowl, then you might as well place him on injured reserve and point, call yeah. up Malcolm Mitchell. And... I think that they could use Mitchell. I mean, the Kenny Britt was inactive in the divisional round, and Philip Dorsett was active, but didn't play a single snap. So I think that kind of tells you where the Patriots are at with Philip Dorsett. And I think that, you know, Malcolm Mitchell could spell Chris Hogan or Danny Amendola or Brandon Cooks out there a little bit. He'd add another little element to the offense. I'm not sure if he's fully ready. I don't know how that knee is feeling. But if Jonathan Jones does have to go to IR, you might as well call it Mitchell just to make the Jaguars prepare for another receiver that they haven't seen all year. All but right. we'll see. 4 p.m. That's the deadline. We shall see. Yeah. Um, guys, any final thoughts here? I don't think so. No. Um, final thoughts. One, one thing that the Jaguars defense does really well that we didn't touch on earlier is score touchdowns. Mm. They've scored eight defensive touchdowns this season, mm. seven of which 
came from front seven players, so defensive linemen, defensive ends, linebackers. That just shows how fast their entire defense is. I mean, they've got four defensive ends slash linebackers who have 50-plus yard touchdowns this year, which you never see. I mean, most of these, most defensive touchdowns are either a, a fat guy falling on the ball in the end zone or, or a pick six. And these guys have playmakers up and down. And for an underdog to win in, in Gillette Stadium, you, need, you usually need some kind of game-changing defensive play, either a turnover or, or a turnover for a touchdown. And the, uh, the Jaguars definitely have the, uh, the ability to, to create those plays. I think my final thought here is just that I kind of doubt Tom Brady will be targeting Brandon Cooks and Chris yeah. Hogan really at all in this game. I think the way to beat the Jaguars is Danny Amendola and those running backs. We saw Vance McDonald, the Steelers tight end, backup tight end, really go off against yeah, the like Jaguars 120 for 128 yards. Yeah. yards. But I was re-watching those, those catches. A lot of them were either flat routes or checkdowns, which isn't really Rob Gronkowski's game. You, you Rob Gronkowski gets by on you know the, the seam routes and some of the deeper routes. So maybe the Patriots will try to change Rob Gronkowski's role a little bit, or maybe they'll just run those same plays using their running backs. And if Rex Burkett can come back in this game, that would be big. Deion Lewis was big in the passing game against the Titans. James White is always a threat as a pass catcher. So I think that we will see probably a lot of two running back sets in this game. We'll see a lot of targets to Rob Gronkowski and Danny Amendola. He'll be going up against uh, Aaron Colvin. He's the, the Jaguar slot cornerback, and he is good, but nowhere near as good as Jalen Ramsey and A.J. Boye. So I think that you almost just forget about the edge of the field with those wide receivers and Chris Hogan and Brandon Cooks, and really just focus all of your attention in the middle, which isn't easy because the Jaguars do have Telvin Smith and, and Miles Jack, who might be the two most athletic linebackers in the NFL. But the Steelers did prove last week by putting up 42 points that there is still a way to beat this Jaguars defense. You just can't allow their offense to match that. Jimmy G, 44 points a couple weeks ago, too. That, too, yeah. Yeah, so this is, a, this is a Jaguars defense that, as much as we're hyping them up, as much as we're talking them up, they've allowed two teams to put up 40-plus points against them in recent weeks. So there's a blueprint out there as to how to move the ball against the Jacksonville defense. All right, well, we'll have everyone covered on everything that's going down. We're hearing from a lot of players this afternoon. We will have that on Nesson.com. All the news throughout the week and, of course, game day coverage. We'll have our pregame show. That will be tons of fun, so make sure to keep it right here, and thanks for listening.